To start things for us this morning, our distinguished guest uh, and new friend here in New York from Japan. Uh, delighted to welcome the Consul General of Japan uh, here in New York. He has been here uh, just since late last year. Ambassador Kanji Yamanuchi has held a great many positions uh, as a diplomat for his country, beginning with a posting uh, more than three decades ago. As a matter of fact, about the time, Jesper, you were probably setting up shop in Japan, uh, Ambassador Yamanuchi had a posting in Washington, D.C. in the mid-'80s. He's also served in Korea and had several uh, senior uh, positions in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Japan. He returned just a few years ago to the uh, Japanese Embassy in Washington. Uh, and we are delighted, sir, uh, that you have been able to join us this morning um, for some welcoming remarks. And uh, the Ambassador did say, by the way, that while Jesper is our featured speaker, uh, when it comes time for questions, if you have questions for the Ambassador, that's okay as well. He'll just tell you if he doesn't want to answer them. Um, <laughs> Please welcome to get us started, Ambassador Kenji Yamanuchi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Tom. Uh, it was a nice uh, introduction for me. And this is my honor to come to Asia Society. Actually, this is my first appearance in Asia Society. I have never been to this building. There inside. will be many more. Yeah. Then yeah. actually, I live here. I mean, very, we're a neighborhood. Uh, my address is 467, 4 East 67 Street. So it's only, I, on the weekend, I walk around here all the time. So I know this is Asia Society, but this is my first time to come in. And for this uh, delighted uh, so, uh, subject about Japan, you just mentioned my sort of background. I joined the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1984. That means 35 years, time flies. Then I, I would sort of uh, try to remember what happened 30 years ago. It was 1989. Uh, Bush 41 came into power. At that time, U.S.-Japan relation was in so good shape in terms of the security side. It was very good. But in terms of the economic side, people described those days boiki masatsu, trade tension, trade uh, frictions. We had a big trade deficit. I mean, U.S. had a big trade deficit against Japan. The more than 50% of the U.S. deficit came from Japan. And every day, the Japan was described in their papers, especially in uh, business uh, papers, uh, basically front page news or second page news. And the tension was so high, it's very uh, political. Then now, we don't see much news about Japan. So sometimes, uh, actually in 30 years ago, I was wishing that yeah, someday no news on Japan on the pages and no friction, and it became true. But somehow I feel a little <laughs> sabishi. <laughs> and so to today, this is a good, good sort of a subject about, about Japan. So I think of Japan, and I, I was told, actually this is my first meeting with Jasper too, and just by it's one of probably the, the best uh, uh, person to describe Japan in a very positive way, very optimistic way. So I really are looking forward to listening to his view. That my view, I, I think the, uh, in the past 30 years, Japan has been through a lot of reforms. And still, we are on that challenge. And every time I'm meet with my American friends about Japan, the Japanese economy, and Japanese society, uh, I hear two views. One view is very positive, very stable, and also, uh, what can I say, it's challenging to the uh, uh, reforms, and very positive. But at the same time, I couldn't help feeling that there's a certain pessimism about us. The biggest problem is population a demography. Now we are experiencing the shrinking population. That is the source of the uh, certain pessimism of our society. Not from Japanese, Japanese, but from the Americans too. But I would say the, uh, the now Prime Minister Abe uh, took the office uh, more than six years ago. It's probably in this coming November, uh, the Prime Minister Abe will be the, the Prime Minister who is having the longest tenure in the Japanese modern history. 
So he has a very strong leadership in terms of this economy. Knowing that, we have a very serious challenges to our society and the economy. So uh, he started with the economics, three pillars, of course, you know, the monetary policy, fiscal policy, and growth strategy. So he's been taking a very, very serious uh, sort of uh, approach uh, to uh, revitalize the Japanese economy. So when we look back in the past six years, I really think there is a the big sort of uh, track record. And GDP has grown more than 10%. That would add uh, $540 billion was added to our GDP uh, in terms of uh, in past six years. And also uh, growth rate uh, is moderate, but in second quarters in a row, we have grown. And this is probably one of the longest period of the growth uh, in the post-war era. And also the Nikkei stock exchange, uh, uh, stock prices has risen uh, to 2.5 uh, times. That's big, big uh, jump. And also when we see the uh, tourism, 10 years ago, the number was about uh, six to seven million people coming to Japan. But last year, 31 million. This is a big jump. And this is also the achievement by Abenomics. And also, the, I just mentioned the uh, uh, shrinking population. And so, in order to compensate the shrinking population, we have three or four sort of uh, measures. The robotics or foreign labor or the, all the people coming back to the labor, and also women. So the, now the Prime Minister Abe uh, 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 put a priority on the womenomics. So the, now the labor part participation uh, ratio of women in the Japanese labor market is uh, 67%. I believe that number is slightly higher than that of the American number. That of course, if you question the quality of that 67% job, and uh, still uh, we are working on that, but uh, uh, major companies set the uh, target on the 30% uh, of the uh, management should be sort of uh, uh, positioned by the uh, women. So it's now we're making the, uh, those uh, very serious uh, effort. And also, I should mention the uh, uh, R&D. So recently, uh, there is an announcement by the Darwin Top 100 Global Innovation. That is the, uh, uh, the companies uh, which are dealing with uh, global innovation and R&D. And about top 100, 39 Japanese companies are listed. That is the biggest number of, uh, by country by country. And also, um, talking about the globalism, the Prime Minister Abe has been taking a very serious lead on, in terms of a free trade agreement. And I know in this country the FTA is not that popular, but the, uh, the Japan did the very serious effort to uh, conclude the uh, free trade agreement with uh, many other countries. So TPP. Actually, TPP was initiated by the four countries many years ago, but the United States took a serious lead. But after leaving, after the United States left, the Japan was working so hard to come up with other 10 countries. So now TPP-11 uh, will enter into effect as of uh, last December. And also Japan concluded the uh, FTA with European community. J EU Japan EPA uh, just came into effect February 1st. So those are also uh, our serious effort for that. And I, finally, I just would mention the, uh, this year, very specifically, Japan will host two very important international conferences. One is G20, that, is be, uh, that will be taking place in Osaka this uh, late uh, June. And also TCAD, that is the, uh, called Tokyo International Conference on African Development. The meeting was, it will be also uh, held in Yokohama. And next year, we have uh, 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games. So now, so we see a lot of signs of optimism. 
But uh, at the same time, I think yeah, there are certain challenges, very serious challenges uh, in front of us. So uh, we've been working. So the glass is full and half empty and half full. But uh, there is a certain uh, optimism. And I'm very looking forward to uh, listening to Jasper's uh, view on the Japanese economy. And I, I hope this uh, uh, discussion will be very productive and uh, provides a lot of uh, insights to the audiences and the uh, people here. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Ambassador. Really appreciate your remarks, and it's a great way to get us started this morning. Um, and now, you all have Jesper Cole's uh, biography, or you should. Um, I'll just say, as I said a moment ago, more than three decades, 1986, right? I've uh, been working and investing in Japan since then, senior positions at uh, J.P. Morgan Japan, Merrill Lynch Japan. And in a very uh, early career, I guess, you spent some time as a uh, an aide to a Japanese member of parliament. So Jesper has seen a lot uh, in his adopted country. He is also, I'm proud to say, a founding uh, member of our latest uh, global center here at the Asia Society, Asia Society Japan. Uh, so it's great to have you here, Jesper. And I want to start, and it's a great uh, place to pick up from where the ambassador left off, uh, with sort of a fundamental question. Now, this program, that the title here, uh, New Golden Age, is not ours. It is Jesper's. Um, in our program, we put a question mark uh, at the end of it um, because we don't, you know, we don't take positions like that. Um, you are sometimes described as uh, Japan's last optimist, apart from the diplomats. Um, and, uh, and there is, uh, as the ambassador said, there has been for a while a mainstream consensus that, that is a little less rosy or maybe, to use your words, sir, glass half empty. Can you give us a, a, an idea of the sources, uh, particularly right now, as you look forward for, for your optimism and your golden age? Yep, no, absolutely. And, and first of all, I mean, close your eyes and pretend that you're in Tokyo, because <laughs> then I could greet you. Welcome to Tokyo, the only city in Asia with clean air, no traffic jams, and a banker who lends you 90% loan to value. <laughs> All of which is true. Um, why am I optimistic? People always say you're crazy. How dare you be optimistic on a country where in 312 years only 17 people are going to be left? <laughs> well, excuse me, I do not care and neither should you about what happens in 300 years. What you care about as a business person, what you care about as an investor, what you care about as an artist, you care about the next three to five years. And Japan is in an absolute sweet spot. And in fact, I think Japan is the model economy. It is capitalism that works. Now, where does my optimism come from? We can define capitalism that works you know, in a little while. Um, but where does my optimism come from? It is exactly the demographics. I want to be reborn as a 23-year-old Japanese. There's no question about this. The demographics is a reality you've got to live with, right? Now the average age outside of Tokyo is 56. Now I love being in Japan and the only reason, or one of the reasons why I've stayed there for such a long time is exactly because everybody else gets older faster than I do, right? Which of course statistically is not quite possible, right? But nevertheless, why is the demography actually a sweet spot? It is exactly because the young generation of Japan, right, is now getting better jobs, higher pay. And you can show this. There's lots of data here. I'm not going to throw all of this data up here. You all know that in 1995, the Japanese government made radical reform, right? 1995 was the annus horribilis, right, for Japan. We had the Kobe earthquake. We had the sarin gas attack, and then in the summer, we had the juice and crisis, so we had a, a savings and loan crisis with run on banks. Prime Minister Hashimoto at the time, radical reform. They changed the labor law. They killed lifetime employment by allowing part-time employment, mm -hmm. contract employment across all industries. And as a result of that, since 1996, the only jobs that were created were part-time jobs. 
full-time jobs were destroyed. And so we now, a couple of years ago, had 40% of everybody who receives a paycheck is actually just part or contract work. 1996 was the death of the salaryman, the death, right, of lifetime employment. So why is this good news? It's good news because you and I don't drive a car by looking in the rearview mirror, right? That was the misery, as it were, of the last 30 years. Now, you've got exactly the tightness of the labor market. The fact that the number of university graduates is declining every year by about 12,000 kids, right? Means that now the Japanese in their 20s, in their 30s, are getting full-time job offers, and you've got leading companies. You've got Toyota, you've got Hitachi, you've got fast retailing, rehiring mm. part-time employees on a full-time basis. And this is hugely important for the system because there's a big difference between a part-time and a full-time employee. The first one is money, right? You effectively, your benefits, right, if you're a full-time employee, go up by about 15%, your pension, your health care. But much more important, and most economists underestimate or rather forget this, you actually, as a, a part-time employee, you do not get the corporate bonus. As a full-time employee, you do get the corporate bonus that gets paid in the summer, it gets paid in the winter. On average, across industries, it's about 35% of your pay. So if I get rehired from part to full-time, my annual income effectively goes up by 5-0, by 50%. And that's happening. You can show it in the data for the last three years, consistent outpacing of full-time employment over part-time employment. Now, higher pay, that's nice. I also get, are there any bankers in the room? Because Japanese banks, oh, sorry, in the back. I, <laughs> Japanese banks are nasty. If you're a part-time employee, love or money does not buy you credit. You can't get a credit card. You cannot get a jutaku mortgage, right? You cannot get a mortgage. The moment I get rehired on a full-time basis, you actually get access to credit. And it's interesting, over the last three years, what do you see? You actually see that housing starts, that condominium sales, that mortgage credit and consumer finance is actually on an uptick. It's not Chinese style 8, 9% growth, right? But after basically one decade, it's not one decade, sorry, one generation of deleveraging, you actually do have now a new credit cycle. It's not companies that are borrowing, it's Mr. and Mrs. Watanabe, particularly the young generation of Japan. So higher money, access to credit, and you're seeing it in the housing cycle. And that is, by the way, what I look at very carefully to verify my thesis of a new golden age, right? If there is this cohort of people in their 20s and 30s who are getting better jobs, access to credit, you should see the housing cycle, right, actually accelerating, which is exactly what's going on, uh, you know, right now, and, uh, you know, is very, very important here. I mentioned three benefits, right? You've got higher income, access to credit. Japanese are very pragmatic people. If I got a part-time job, I can probably charm my way into getting a date, but I cannot get married. The moment I get a full-time job, my probability of getting married goes up to 92%, right? And you're actually seeing, I mean, the data is beginning to inflect, right? You actually see, most importantly, the fertility rate, right, has increased, right? It's still way below, you know, the two that you need for sustainability, you know, but you've got a basic, back rock of a normal, of a healthy economic development that is endogenous, that is not dependent on strong exports to America, it is not dependent on strong exports to the People's Republic of China, it is endogenous. This is a structural thing. Fun fact, wages on average are growing at a rate of around two, one and a half to two percent right now, right? Um, but the fun fact is that starting salaries for university graduates are rising at a rate of around 6%, right? Last year, 99% of Japanese university graduates got a full-time job offer within 10 days of looking for one. Trust me, you too want to be reborn as a 23-year-old <laughs> Japanese. But it's very interesting, right? So it's, you've got this backbone. You know, I believe that Japan will be the only 
OECD country where we will see the rise of a new middle class. Japan is the one country where if you're a kid in your 18s, in your 18s? That's not a teens. phrase. In your teens, you know, trust me, you will be better off than your parents. Now, whether your parents had such a good time or not is, is anecdotal. It's not anecdotal. It's, you know, it doesn't really matter because that's a rearview mirror. Looking forward, that's what you've got here, right? The second reason for why I'm very optimistic, mm -hmm. right? I'm sorry, you've you got an economist talking, you know, so that's... It's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun facts. Keep but going. You've got, yeah. you've, the most important one is the demographics, right? You've got something that's self-sustaining, that's, that's endogenous, and it's forcing Japanese corporations, you know, to actually rethink the way they, they use employment, which is very important. That's where the, where the key driver, right, behind womenomics. Why is womenomics working? It's exactly because you've got this scarcity. So everybody, whether you're Hitachi, whether you're Toyota, uh, you know, you have to rethink your management style, right, and employ females, right, is one solution. Very important, and Japan is brilliant at this, right? It's not just redefining the role of women, it's redefining the role of men. Because trust me, you don't want to be a Mitsubishi man. If you're a Mitsubishi man, your life's horrible, right? Sorry, it used to, is anybody here from Mitsubishi? Yeah. <laughs> if so, they're not going to raise their hand. No, no. no but, but, but look, I mean, you know, it, you know, you're a company employee. This is terrible, right? You are stuck right, in a social construct that basically allows you to see your children for 14 minutes every week, right? Changing that, Prime Minister Abe and his team is actually doing a very, very good job, right? So that now it's okay if I work at Mitsubishi, I'm on the career path, but it's okay to leave the office at four o'clock to pick up my child, right, from daycare. That's a huge part. I mean, we talk about redefining the, gen the gender roles for women. That's important, obviously, but you've got to redefine the gender roles for men, right, as well, particularly in the workplace, and that's exactly what's going on in Japan. But the key point, right, about, you know, the, the second reason for why I'm bullish on Japan, right? Uh, you've got the demographics, got the demographic sweet spot, you've got the rise of the new middle class. The second thing is corporate Japan has changed. Corporate Japan used to be an insider's club, right? Uh, in the 1990s, 50%, half of the equity was tied up in Keidetsu Holdings, right? So it was, you know, the Mitsubishi family, the Sumitomo family, the uh, Mitsui family, and if you were not a member of that club, if you were not an insider, you had no access to information, you had no access to, co to corporate strategy, you had no access in many cases to corporate accounts. This has changed. Cross shareholdings, mochiai, right, have gone from 50% in the early 90s down to about 5%. And they're going to be sold off even further, right? And this means that corporate Japan is open for business, right? Used to be an insider's club, now it's open for business. And you're actually seeing that fundamental change, how open corporate Japan has become. Let me use one example. A couple of years ago, we had Toshiba, right? The big Toshiba incident. Oh, my God. Now, in the old system of governance, right, the group would have come to rescue the company. And remember, Toshiba is one of the oldest members of the Mitsui Keidetsu, right? This time, the Mitsui Keidetsu, the Mitsui group said, no, no touch. And the net result is that now Toshiba, 72% is owned by the devil, sorry, by uh, global investors, right? <laughs> but you see what I'm saying, right? Olympus, eight, nine years ago, was still a different case, right? There, the Sumitomo family, Sumitomo Bank, stepped in and basically ring-fenced the company and did it their way, right? But this has changed now. If you look at, you know, the openness of corporate Japan, Prime Minister Abe has done a fantastic job. Most important, two years ago now, in 2017, they changed the taxation code, right, for corporate spin-outs, right? So if you're a Japanese company and you have all these different subsidiaries, you know, that that, that you're there, you couldn't sell those subsidiaries even though they were no longer part of your core competence because you were facing a huge tax bill. It had to be marked to market, you had to pay the full taxes on that. That was changed by Prime Minister Abe in 2017. What do you see as a result? A growing boom, right, of corporate spin-offs. And some of the leading private equity firms from the United States, actually, right, are now involved with the biggest conglomerates in Japan, right, to actually do some of these spin-outs, which means that corporate Japan is getting lean and mean, right? It's not, you know, a sprint. It's a marathon, right? But the path has actually opened up. And I think that that's very, very important. And then finally, you've got a positive feedback loop, right, from the labor shortage, right, 
actually forcing domestic M&A among small and medium-sized companies. These are not the global contenders, but this is the domestic economy. You actually do see, right, that, you know, whether it's regional banks, whether it is logistics companies, that the small and medium-sized companies, the domestic service sector part, that's where you're seeing a wave of M&A activity, right? And the driver, right, is not capital, Right? A shortage of capital. The driver is actually a shortage of labor. And again, that makes me very, very hopeful that productivity in the domestic economy, right, because of this pickup in M&A uh, that is forced by the labor shortage, actually means that productivity growth in Japan, uh, particularly in the domestic service sector, uh, is going to be very, very much surprising on the upside. So that's, you know, what I wanted to say. And notice I haven't said a single word about Japanese politics. No, but it is, you know, Prime Minister Abe is a smart man. Uh, you seize the opportunity, right? Um, and, uh, you know, the great news is that, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, that the domestic dynamics from the labor market, right, the domestic dynamics from the corporate sector, right, is actually being compounded by the one thing that you and I as private entrepreneurs, as private investors actually want from government. We want stability. We don't want this constant tweeting. Sorry, sorry, tweet. sorry. Um, <laughs> we don't. We don't want constant change. We want stability. I've been in Japan since 1995. There were exactly two prime ministers who were in power for more than 15 months. You can't run a country like that, mm -hmm. right? Now, whether you like Abe or not, right? This is an incredibly stable team that is incredibly pragmatic. One of the great things about Prime Minister Abe, right, is that they are unbelievably open for ideas. There is no dogma on how to do things, right? They frequently have, you know, whether it's global investors, whether it is global consultants, whether it's global scientists, whether it's global artists, right, visiting the Prime Minister's office just for an open brainstorm, right? Um, so it's very, very interesting that the pragmatism the lack of hardcore ideology, right, uh, actually allows, you know, a great openness, right, in Japan. And I would say this on a personal note, I've been involved in, you know, the Japanese media, Japanese public, Japanese policymaking at the fringes, you know, for the last 25 years or so, and there were certain issues that were taboo. There were things you could not talk about. You couldn't talk about security. You could not talk about security policy, right? Now you can. You could not talk about womenomics, right? Empowering women. Oh, you're some gaijin, right? With some weird ideas, right? Now it's fully embraced, right? Um, you know, you could not talk about entrepreneurship um, and venture capital. Now you actually can, and there's a thriving startup scene that is, uh, uh, you know, happening in Tokyo right now. And then, last but not least, yes, you could not talk about the emperor. Now you can. And in fact, we've got a very happy moment, right? Um, on the 1st of May, as you know, Japan will have a big party, right? In fact, I'm very grateful to the Japanese government because they're forcing me to take a 10-day holiday, right? <laughs> because of the start of the new imperial reign, you know? But, you know, the, the, the key issue is, again, that there's an enormous amount of pragmatism, you know, that you actually have in the government. So the force of the demographics forcing you to fundamentally rethink everything, the fact that companies have opened up and are no longer encumbered by this group mentality because the cross shareholdings have been unwound, plus the fact that yes, I've got a pragmatic, non-ideological, right, government, right, um, you know, that actually, you know, has created a phenomenal backdrop and Japan has not just become a bastion of stability, but Japan has become the preferred place for many companies to actually establish their headquarters in Asia Pacific. Let me give you a concrete example. If you look at healthcare, if you look at renewable medicines, right, Saise Irio, right, where Japan is one of the leaders, I mean, they got the Nobel Prize for the stem cell research after all, Yamanaka Sensei, right, you find that all the leading global biotech companies, right, are all rushing to be in Japan because Japan offers stability perfect intellectual property protection, which is probably the only country in Asia where you actually do have, you know, proper and guaranteed rule of law and intellectual property protection, right? Plus, yes, it is the greatest place to live on earth. So, Jesper. <laughs> um, Are you ready to move? Well, well <laughs> maybe I have to talk to my family, but, but um, I, I do, I, I want to just 
remind you, Jesper, and tell the audience because they wouldn't know that I used to be a journalist, and that only comes to mind because you can't, when you have been a journalist for a long time as I was, you can't listen to a super rosy outlook on anything without reflexively wanting to pick it apart a little bit. So with that in mind, um, j just two quick things and then to the audience. One is your, your comment about 300-plus uh, years from now, they'll have all this trouble or they won't have any more people. Uh, I, you know, and I obviously I understand and appreciate that for investors, uh, the outlook is a matter of months or maybe just a couple of years. But to your 23-year-old who you would like to be reincarnated as, uh, I mean, these demographic, demographic issues that the country faces, and we don't need to review them all, uh, but I mean, it really is a, a, an aging, well, hold on, let me ask my question. <laughs> let's, instead of 300 years, let's take 20. So when that 23-year-old is 43, wh where is Japan going to be at vis-a-vis -vis these kinds of issues? What makes you think, or why should we believe, that uh, that, that demographic crisis isn't going to hit home a lot sooner? There, there is no demographic crisis. There's a demographic opportunity. Okay? Mm. Um, now, so we, it's getting better for the young. Fine, we can all see that, right? You want to be a 23-year-old Japanese, but quite frankly, you actually want to be a 68-year-old Japanese as well. The Japanese are the richest baby boom generation on earth, right? Do not forget this, right? Uh, my favorite statistics on Japan is 48%. 48% of all Japanese over the age of 20 have no debt. There's no student debt, there's no credit card debt, there's no mortgage debt, but those 48% own the home that they live in. The baby boom generation, right? basically entered the workforce in the early 80s, got married and took out a mortgage during the bubble years, right? And then we had the collapse in asset prices, right? But they never got fired. They never got foreclosed by their bank. It didn't feel good because you had negative equity. I get that, right? But now 25 years have passed. The debt has been paid off, right? So the interesting thing is why is the demographics not an issue? Because as they say in China, Japan is lucky because it got, old, it got rich before it got old, mm. right? So from that perspective, you know, there is going to be very interesting policy, in my personal opinion, that you will see where basically means testing, right, is going to become more important, right? Which is to say, I mean, as you know, Japan has a de facto socialized Medicare and pension system, right? Um, and, you know, there are now some bills, right, in front of Parliament to discuss, right? Well, if your financial assets are more than $100,000 and you have no mortgage debt, then your out-of-pocket expense for medical treatment should not be 30%, but should be 60, 70, 80, 90%, which is a great way, right, to resolve this whole issue of where we are globally, where we are in the US as well. You've got now a third generation after a big war, right, that is very rich. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. The question is how do I ease the burden of public liabilities, right? And I have got to find a way to tax the wealth effectively. Mm -hmm. Now, taxing the wealth by imposing a wealth tax is not going to get you elected but doing it on an excise basis, right? So on a pay-as-you-go basis, if you've got fair means testing, right, certainly would be one way forward to actually help solve the problem mm -hmm. there, right? One other follow-up, and then uh, to the room. Uh, it's not really a follow-up, but you've both raised the issue of women in Japan uh, in, in different ways. And um, I'm sure many people in this room, I don't know if, if either of you saw, there was a front-page article in the New York Times the other day about... Uh, about women in uh, in Japan, and really it goes to the point I think you made about men in Japan, Jesper, because it was talking about for all the political uh, oomph behind Abenomics and all the opportunities that you've described, that the fact of the matter is that these women in the household, try as they might, are kind of stuck in the household, not because of their own volition and not because there aren't opportunities, but because... Uh, care for the kids and everything else is still done 90 plus percent by them and that just the, the constraints and the pressures of that leave them in the home yeah. even when they don't. Now that was anecdotal but it was a, a big piece no. and got a lot of attention. No, and this is the interesting part. Uh, is this an enormous pressure cooker of a society? I mean, am I glad that I'm not Japanese? Absolutely. 
right? Um, you know, and particularly for Japanese women, once you have a family, right, the social pressures are absolutely enormous. How that is going to change, right, basically, you know, depends on the grassroots cultures, right, of the different schools, of the different kindergartens, of the corporations that you're working in. So there's a lot of social dynamics, right, um, that is going to, uh, going to have to change, and that is actually changing, you know, very, very pragmatically. Right? Can I do one other thing? Sure. The ambassador wanted a word, but but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> the, the the other thing, of course, is it's is, it's very interesting because you know, oh, immigration, oh, well, Japan immigration, this, that, or the other. Well, do you do, do, do you know that this is the most pragmatic immigration policy on earth? When Johns Hopkins University shipped me to Japan in 1985, right, on my student visa, I was allowed to work for 12 hours a week. Today, on a student visa, you're allowed to work for 38 hours a week which is three hours more than a Frenchman works anyways. <laughs> you know, so there's some pragmatism. Also, data, right? And, you know, I'm happy to throw up the data here. If you look at the data, right, um, it's very interesting. Now, in Japan, one in four people is now over 65, right? Now, no foreigner comes to Japan except Donald Keane to retire, right? Um, you know, but, you know, if you look at the working age population, right, if you look at 15 to 65-year-old, you find that in Tokyo, right, which is, after all, about 40% of the Japanese economy, in Tokyo, uh, six years ago, 3.1% of the people who got a paycheck were non-Japanese. Last year, it was 6.7%. In Shinjuku, right, which is where actually the mayor's, the Tokyo governor's office is, right, in Shinjuku, right, 13% of the population between, uh, uh, between 15 and 65 year old are non-Japanese. This is very, very pragmatic, what's going on. Green card has changed tremendously, Eijuken, right? So it used to be 10 years. You stay in Japan for 10 years, you don't fall far on the laws, you can get permanent residency. Then it was five years. Right? There's a bill in front of parliament now to cut it down to three years. Right? Japan is going to be one of the easiest countries in Asia to actually get permanent residency. Now, they're still Japanese. In those three years or in those five years right now, if you got a parking ticket, you got to go back to the queue. So it's tough immigration policy, yes, you know, but, you know, mm -hmm. from, a, from a sort of pragmatic perspective. And do you see, I mean, if you look at, you know, the financial sector, if you look at the, uh, you know, the big corporate sector now, you basically find that in terms of hirings, right, for example, the convenience stores, right, which is a high growth area in urban Japan, right, one in three people they've hired over the last three years is a non-Japanese. Right? So it's a very, very pragmatic approach that you, that you actually have. So you've got the women issue, which is more of a social issue in terms of what, what, what are the bigger barriers, right? But in terms of the immigration, uh, you know, Japan is actually extremely pragmatic. I just mentioned the two things. One is the birth rate. So the population now is shrinking. And some years ago, the birth rate went down to 1.27%. It was a shock. If we need to have the two 0.2%, so go get to the birth rate, we need two uh, in order to maintain this uh, actual population. But that birth rate went down to 1.27%. The people felt a very crisis. Therefore, the government uh, started to take very comprehensive policies on, in many layers. So now that ratio came back to 1.47 and in a just five years term. So the thing is, so now government is taking these policies and that would work. So I cannot predict when uh, the bus rate come back to two point, mm -hmm. but um, still it's uh, changing in the right direction. Right. And the other thing is the foreign labor. I don't use the word immigration, but uh, when we focus on the foreign labor, the, uh, the National Diet just uh, enacted a new law, new le legislation to uh, manage the foreign labor to the Japanese market in a very older way. So Jasper just mentioned the, all the examples of the foreign labor with a very great st statistics. But now the institution and the procedure would be uh, introduced that would encourage more orderly foreign labor in Japanese markets. That is good. Can I make one comment on this? Sorry. Sure. Sorry. I just want to make sure we get questions from yep. the room. We, yep. we, is that okay? Yes. 
No, because you know, so 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 just to say something negative or to say something. Look, you know, you got to. It's 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 always a fight. There's always friction. There's always debate. So Japan did hataraki katakaikaku, work life balance reform, right? Uh, which you know, as as an employee, as an employer, quite frankly, is 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 a bit of a pain because now I've got to clock everybody and make sure that they leave at five o'clock and take every fourth Friday as a holiday. You know, so it's 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 a bit of a bit of bureaucratic thing. But the issue is that you know. What they have not done, right? There is nothing being done to encourage pay for performance, mm. right? This is very important. That de facto you've got a corporate culture, and this is true for small and medium-sized companies, and this is true for large companies. You know, we've got a corporate culture that is still dominated by seniority. So people get on the escalator, right? They stand on the escalator and and go up, right? Pay for performance, right? Mm. You know, would Open up things quite a lot, right? So, for example, I'm going to be anecdotal. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I had a Japanese friend of mine. Uh, his son is at MIT, and you know, was graduating, and he got a job offer from a German company, from an American company, and from a uh, Japanese company. Right, and so he said, "Yeah, you know, yes, but you've met Hiroshi a couple of times. You know, why don't you give him a call? You know, tell him, you know, give him some advice." And I said, "Ito-san." What do you want me to tell Hiroshi? If he joins the American company and he's good and lucky, in 15 years he can run the company. If he joins the German company and he's good and lucky, in 15 years he can be in charge of a region, Latin America, Asia, mm -hmm. right? If he joins the Japanese company and he's good and lucky, what's it going to be in 15 years? Kacho? Section chief? I mean, you know, I mean, the A team doesn't want to work in Japan. Right, because the A team is not offered right a top performing culture right where you can actually advance right. So it's quite interesting that that part you know mm -hmm. of the of the cultural construct right. And there's good things and bad things obviously about uh, uh, about lifetime employment right. But you know the fact that you know the you know the annual review process right in a Japanese corporation is a lot of procedural right mm -hmm. but in terms of an outcome are you differentiated between the top quintile versus the bottom quintile right is there you know an incentive that is given right for the vast majority of Japanese it's culture the, yeah. this is absolutely missing and that's I think a bottleneck right uh, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, Hitachi, Mitsubishi, all these companies, you know, to survive and to really be global top contenders, you've got to tap into the global pool of engineers, right? And, you know, that barrier, right, I think remains, you know, a very, very large one. Okay, to the room. It's actually fascinating that they are, I think you said 39 companies in Japan that are on that, or you did, sir, on the innovation uh, yes. top 100, given what you just said, that they still rank as highly as they do. Anyway, are there questions uh, from the room? We have some from online. Claire Chino from our Asia 21 Young Leaders Network and our center in Japan. I embarrass you with all that, but it's great to see you, and uh, you can have the first question. Great, thank you so much. Um, you touched upon uh, corporate governance, yeah. Jesper. So if I could uh, come back to that topic. Yeah. I think it's been uh, four years since uh, Japan introduced the corporate governance code, which of course talks about things like uh, cross-shareholding. Uh, if you are to cross-sharehold, you have to actually give a good reason for that. Um, I'm just wondering, so in four years' time, do you actually see statistically, in terms of numbers, how successful that corporate governance code was and I guess uh, there's a, a reason behind my question, which is that when I talk to my American colleagues about ESG, environment, social, and governance, everybody's so interested about Japanese governance, especially right. in the day and age of uh, seeing Mr. Gone in the, the newspapers all over. Right. So very, very interesting, and it's it's hugely important. You know, I think that in terms of governance, in terms of stewardship, right, that uh, you know the uh, public pension fund, the GPIF, right, is really spearheading the effort, right? And Prime Minister Abe, you know, did appoint Mr. Mizuno, uh, you know, from the private sector, you know, to, to be the CIO there, you know, and that's been a great, great spearheading. Um, and in terms of ESG investment, you know, the GPIF uh, is actually, you know, in my opinion, the global leader. Right, in the sense of that you say, fine, so we, we are in favor of ESG investment. We think that that's a viable thing. Here is one trillion yen 
create an index, right? Create an investment strategy for me that focuses on ESG, and there's a womenomics, you know, uh, uh, one as well there. So it's not just like many other public pension funds. You know, they talk the talk but never walk, right? While uh, you know the Japanese government actually put funds, right, to actually seed, as it were, right, mm -hmm. that sort of investment coming through as well there. In terms of outcome, you know, after four years, do you see any concrete change? If I put on my day job as an investment advisor, right, the answer is yes. Um, you can show the chart that the ROE, right, return on equity, which, you know, is probably a nice, simple way of measuring things from a selfish investor perspective, you know, in Japan has climbed, you know, structurally, right? We shall see how sustained that's going to be, right? But I think that the, uh, you know, the answer is that uh, it's likely to be very, very sustained, right? Because this is being embraced, right, uh, by Japanese corporations. One thing, just to be balanced here, Tom, right? Mm -hmm. um, the public pension is the absolute leader, the private pension are absolutely nowhere, which is shocking, right? Um, that is true in terms of the way they run their asset allocation committees, right? It's very interesting. You may, you may want to know that of the Japanese asset management companies, right, only one of them actually has an independent audit committee. Wow. Now, if I give you money and you're my, you, you know, you're, you're my, my agent, right, and I want you to do, you know, proper governance, but you yourself don't have proper governance, how does that work? Right? So from that perspective, you know, there's, there's in terms of the domestic private sector, right, on the asset management side, there's a lot more work that actually needs to be done. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, uh, you mentioned a rule of law, and I wanted to ask you, by the way, I relate to your sentiment that it is one of the best places in the world to live. <laughs> We were fortunate enough to live there for four and a half years. Nonetheless, rule of law, and can you please put the gone uh, business into some context? I mean, when we listen to this here, uh, you know, that he doesn't, we don't know what is being, what he's being accused of, and he doesn't have full access to his lawyer, so it's a bit different uh, compared to our way of practicing law. And we should probably uh, let everybody know, I assume you know, we're talking about Carlos Ghosn, Nissan chief, and what's been going. It's kind of interesting that we've gone this far in the conversation without so, mentioning him. So, yeah. full disclosure, um, you know, in, in the first three or four years, I had quite a lot of dealings with Carlos Ghosn. Um, after that, you know, um, he, uh, not, not that much anymore. Um, I want to say that uh, Carlos Ghosn, uh, in my personal opinion, is one of the best managers of our generation. I mean, you take a bankrupt Japanese company, you merge it with a third-rate French state-owned enterprise, and you turn it into a global top contender. I mean, that's no mean feat, right? So absolutely no question, uh, you know, in terms of the managerial, uh, you know, uh, supremeness, you know, that we've seen there. Having said that, the Japanese law is unbelievably fair. It doesn't matter whether you're a common thief, whether you're a cheating housewife, or whether you're a global Davos rock star, right? It's very clear what he's being accused of. There's no question. He does have access to lawyers, right? Is the Japanese legal system harsh in the sense of that, yes, Japan never signed the habeas corpus, right? But, you know, it doesn't matter, like I said, whether you're a Yakuza boss, right, or whether you're a global rock star, right? Um, you're treated equally, right, by the law, and you cannot buy your way around it, right? Um, so from that perspective, again, I've got huge sympathies, and I wouldn't, wouldn't want to wish this on my worst enemy, right? But, you know, in terms of all over the world, and it's very clear, by the way, what he's being accused of, right? He's being accused of greed and self-enrichment. Japan will never tolerate greed and self-enrichment. None of the scandals that we've had during the 1960s, during the 1970s, 80s, 90s, there was never any self-enrichment, with the possible exception of the Lockheed scandal, right? It was all, you know, corporate screw-up, right? But nobody got rich in the process. This is he's being accused of basically enriching himself, right? Is there a responsibility that the board has? Absolutely. I mean, you know, if they didn't know, right, that would be a huge shock. Right? Um, but we shall see where the investigation goes. I certainly have full faith 
right, in the independence of the Japanese legal system. And by the way, just to make a point, just to be slightly controversial here, everywhere in the world, right, we are complaining about, you know, the top 1% owning XYZ, right? Japan is not a plutocracy. Mm -hmm. Japan will never tolerate a plutocracy. There's plenty of rich people. There is plenty of ways to get rich in Japan. It's very ironic on literally the months that Carlos got arrested, right? One of the high-flying new tech superstars in Japan spent $100 million to buy a Basquiat painting mm -hmm. and a week later bought the ticket to go to the moon, right, from Elon Musk. You know, this is Zuzu Town. I mean, you probably never heard of the company, right? Um, but, you know, there's, there's plenty of ways to get rich in Japan. There's plenty of rich people in Japan, right? Um, and if I have a personal opinion on this, and I'm not a lawyer, right? I think the one mistake that Mr. Gorn may have made is fine. You run a Japanese company, right? And he was very conscious at the beginning. He never raised his salary until they paid a dividend. Right? So you played the game very, very well. And then something happened. Right? I don't know whether it's true or whether it's not true. Right? But the thing is, fine, if you do get bids from Ford, from Chrysler, right? that basically double your or triple your salary, right? then fine. Introduce a culture of pay for performance into your own company. Don't hide it. So that's the one thing that I find very bizarre, because there's no reason why Nissan must play the Japanese game of lifetime employment compensation, right? There's plenty of reasons, right? And plenty of ways to actually change, you know, the corporate culture towards a culture of pay for performance, pay for what you're worth, right? And that, you know, in my personal opinion, right, uh, you know, is, 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 is the one thing where, where, where I, I, you know, I, I think this, this managerial supremacy that he had, right, uh, may have gotten a little bit sidetracked. We could probably spend the whole hour talking about that, actually. But thank you for your question. Uh, anyone else? Yes, Matt. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I, well, just a little background. I worked in Japan uh, from 1990 to 96, uh, when Japan was really, really still one of the best places to enjoy uh, the prosperity. Uh, and uh, I recently went back, uh, co-chairing a Japan conference in Tokyo where actually Jeff Sayu spoke to us. Uh, so I got updated about what's going on. And I must say, I wish my husband could move with me back to Tokyo because it's definitely a very exciting place to be. Uh, the opportunities are there, uh, it's a much more humble the Japan I would describe mm. than back in the 90s, which makes it uh, just fascinating place to be in and a lot of excitement in the world. Uh, my, one observation though, um, I would like to uh, have your take on it because I'm more on, I'm in management of companies, whereas your view is from probably an economist type of view. Uh, from a management standpoint, the biggest issue is the labor, how do you, the, and the employment relationship. And uh, you started to talk up about that, uh, being 20, 30s, being 60s, great to be in Japan. The biggest problem is what do you do with the uh, people from the 40s, the 50s? Given the long, even though the lifetime employment is collapsing, however, you still have mm -hmm. some sort of social contract with those in the 40s and 50s. Uh, that becomes a big issue. And another thing, it's a, not only a bottleneck in terms of corporate performance, but also uh, Japan being Japan Inc. Without, without solving that problem on a society level, um, you have frustrated 20s and 30s that do not get to do their best work. Uh, and you also have a very unproductive labor stock in a place. Uh, so in a way, if 
one thing that's lacking in the Japan's society is a very vital, robust, mid-higher market. Uh, with that, then the, you will, uh, the, the companies will be able to release the 40-50s into the society, uh, and, and the, the younger generation and women will have more leverage to force corporations to change in a way, because the, the current structure doesn't allow the leverage of individual to force change that you see in other countries. Right. And so do you have any updates on where it is in terms of robust so, so this, 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 you know, and this is, this is one of the nice things because there are many aspects, right, of lifetime employment, right, that are absolutely fantastic. And it's exactly, you know, one of the reasons for why Japan is such a nice place to live and so very civil, right, because people, yes, even if I'm a slacker, right, I can stay on the escalator and I can enjoy, right. Uh, now, from an investor's perspective, ooh, you know, you're not maximizing your productivity, et cetera, et cetera. So that tension, right, um, you know, I think will stay in Japan, right? I think will get, you know, more intense, right, precisely because of this labor shortage, right, that you actually have. Now, as a manager, right, what do you do? There's nothing that prevents you in any corporation from, um, you know, from introducing pay for performance. Absolutely nothing, right? There's also, you know, Japanese employment law, people always say, ooh, Japanese employment, you can't fire anybody. Yes, you can't fire people. I mean, let me give you an example, Komatsu. Komatsu, which is one of the great companies in Japan, right? They closed two, in the 90s, they closed two factories in a town called Komatsu, which is now a disaster, right? But I mean, it's perfectly possible to do this, right? You just gotta have guts, sorry, from a management perspective. You gotta have, you know, a manager, Right or a leader who is not a salary man, right, but is actually a visionary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So it's so it's perfectly possible, right, um, you know, to actually do that, right. But you've got to create a corporate culture. There's one thing that that you know I always advise Japanese companies to do, right, um, is invest in your people, right, and you know what you guys call here continuing education. Right, um, you know, investing precisely into people, you know, in their late twenties, into their or their early thirties, you know, to get additional degrees, right, to get additional training. That's something, right, that a good corporation, right, would do. One final point, and this, you know, I've just I've spent, you know, a, a couple of months in the in the venture capital scene, right. I feel, ha, you know, it's just I'm just a boring economist, and now I'm, you know, at the, at the cusp of uh, of all the funky stuff. It's actually quite interesting, right? Um, several of the Japanese big tech companies, right, last year introduced this 15% rule, right? That you are working for me, but 15% of your time, yeah. please use on a project that you like to do. Right, and then once a month or once a quarter, we have little competitions, right, where you make a case for your project, right, and if the the committee deems that it's a good project, we will give you three months off, right, and a little bit of funding to actually develop that sort of thing. That's what's happening in some of the leading tech companies in Japan, which is very very exciting. I mean, maybe Silicon Valley has been doing this for the last twenty years, whatever, right? But the Japanese, in terms of the corporate culture, right. Is this beginning to change? I think in some of the companies, absolutely yes. And the re I didn't articulate my question clearly. We I, I was looking more for a, a mid-higher, yeah. mid-higher uh, market. Yeah. Where is the market? Where is the market? Where is the market? Where is the market? Where is the but for the but but that's exactly right. So for 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 the for the mid higher labor market, right? The only people you can hire or you could hire ten years ago, right, were the people who didn't get along with their boss, right? So now you know what do you offer? You've got to be more competitive. If I offer a better plan, right, a better lifestyle balance, if I offer you an additional education punch, I can pinch people from the best we'll companies in people. Japan. Right. Uh, we have time for one more. Uh, let's go to the back and uh, there. Yeah. Hi, good morning. Thank you for being here this morning. Um, my question is with the ongoing U.S. and China trade war. Um, do you view that as a potential opportunity or a threat for China and Japan to strengthen their trade and political ties? Good question. This is, this is you know, a very, very interesting question. And let me give you a thesis. Um, I believe that Prime Minister Abe's legacy will be the uh, uh, Japan-China relationship 
right? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, as you know, uh, in the first six years, he never had a bilateral with uh, the Chinese premier, right? Uh, in October last year, after he got confirmed, after Abe got confirmed for an additional three years in power, right, uh, he did have a one and a half day bilateral, right, in Beijing, right, um, and uh, it's very likely that the premier is going to move, uh, is going to come for bilateral to Japan, right, maybe he's even going to be the first foreign dignitary to uh, meet with the new emperor, right, we shall see well, about that, right, but in terms of substance, which is more important, right? Uh, I think it's become reasonably obvious, and you are not speaking to a China expert. I know China only through Japanese eyes, right? Um, you know that some of the Chinese initiatives, the Belt and Road Initiative, right, the expansion into Africa, have hit some barriers, right? Debt diplomacy, whatever you know, fancy, fancy slogan you want to put on, put onto that, right? So having a multilateral approach, right, where Japan sort of serves as a buffer, right, in the infrastructure development projects, right, that uh, Asia led by China is trying to do, right? I think that that's exactly what's coming through. Very specifically, you may have seen uh, in the October bilateral summit last year, they did sign an agreement, right, for joint bidding of public infrastructure projects. Now, is this the start of Airbus? I mean, there's <laughs> a thousand issues, right, between Japan and China, you know, that need to be resolved in many different ways, right? But certainly, if you empirically look, if you just look at the data, Japan and China are the densest economic relationship in global economic history. If you look at labor flow, if you look at capital flows, if you look at the flow of goods and services, it is denser than Germany was with France, England with the, with the United States, or the United States with Mexico. It's an incredibly dense relationship. I always use the statistics, 41% of the graduate students at Tokyo and Kyoto University are Chinese. This is a very powerful nexus that you've got, right, with a lot of legacy, a lot of overlay on both parts, right? But in terms of, you know, the pragmatism of the economic relationship, right? Now, whether the current American stance, right, of aggressive unilateralism, if that's a term, right, whether that will hold or not, we shall see. We need to ask the diplomats, right? Uh, or maybe we need to ask the American people, right, more importantly, right? But certainly the fact that Abe that Japan has not once veered from a multilateral first approach. The TPP was done, right? The relationship with the EU, right, was done as, as the ambassador pointed out, right? In my personal opinion, I think that Prime Minister Abe will broker for China to join the TPP before America does. Anyway, you see, I've had obviously some sake. <laughs> How ironic that would be. Thank you for your question. Your question, by the way, reminds me, um, in addition to all the events I mentioned at the outset uh, coming at the Asia Society, the next edition of this uh, breakfast briefing program, we don't normally do them on Mondays, but we will on Monday, March the 4th, uh, which will be the first full working day after the U.S.-China trade deadline. Uh, so we will bring Wendy Cutler, who helped negotiate the TPP and is deeply engaged in all these trade questions, and other guests for a kind of snap analysis for something we're calling U.S.-China deal or no deal. Uh, that's the 4th of March um, for the next Asia Breakfast Briefing. Um, I don't know whether our guests may stick around if you have some questions and just want to come up and, and ask them, but we are out of time. I want to thank Ambassador Yamanuchi, Jesper Cole for a great conversation, and thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you.